Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Time to return to our retrospective series and this time with a new title. As you've guessed by now, I'm a huge fan of Resident Evil and I thought it would be nice to talk about this series that a lot of us love. I must say this will be quite the journey, so let's get started. This series will cover all main entries of Resident Evil, including Code Veronica and, possibly, the first survival one. I will also be releasing each part following the game release order and not its timeline. As most of you know, the name behind the game is Shinji Mikami, an icon in survival horror. The game, known as Biohazard in Japan and Resident Evil in the rest of the world due to licensing issues, was launched in March 1996 for the PS1, Saturn and PC. Resident Evil was in part inspired by another Capcom's game, Sweet Home, an RPG horror title released for the Famicom. Sweet Home was done to promote a movie with the same title and told the story of a group of characters that had special abilities uh, necessary to escape some kind of cursed mansion. Mikami wanted to bring the puzzle structure and mansion setting to his new game. At first, it was to be a first-person shooter, something that we ended up seeing in Resident Evil 7. However, this idea was scrapped in favor of a fixed camera game with pre-rendered background as already seen in games like Alone in the Dark. Before starting the game, we are invited to choose which character we will be controlling, Jill Valentine or Chris Redfield, which, in a manner of speaking, is easy mode or hard mode considering that Jill has two extra inventory slots, can get the shotgun much faster than Chris, and has access to the bazooka, the second strongest weapon in the game. This retrospective will mainly focus on Jill's perspective, showing some differences you will encounter in Chris's playthrough. We will be following the investigation, if we can call it like that, of the special tactics and rescue services of the Raccoon City Police Department. Stars for short. The story begins with the Alpha team departing to the Arclay Mountains in search of the missing Bravo team that was sent to investigate bizarre murders that have been happening in the city. Right at the beginning, the game gives us a dark tone, providing few brutal details of what's happening. After some minutes flying over the mountains, Alpha team quickly discovers that Bravo's helicopter crashed. While no one was inside, most of the equipment was left behind, something rather strange. This is also where the mission goes from bad to worse, as the team is attacked by a pack of dogs soon after Joseph discovers a weapon attached to a hand that most likely belonged to a fallen Bravo member. Unfortunately, Jill doesn't make it in time, and Joseph is killed by the pack. Trying to defend themselves, the remaining team shoots at the dogs that seem not to react to any of the attacks. Seeing no chances in winning this encounter, they decide to retreat and run towards the helicopter. However, and for some reason, Brad decided to take off leaving the others in a rather complicated situation. No options left, they all run towards a mansion where they thought they would be safer. Depending on the choice you made before starting the game, you can either have Chris or Barry missing after running away from the dogs. Considering we are controlling Jill, Chris is missing and she's worried about him. Wesker prevents her from opening the main door as the dogs are surely waiting on the other side. Before insisting, the group hears a shot coming from another room, hoping it's Chris. Barry and Jill are sent to investigate while Wesker remains in the main hall. Jill quickly finds out that the person shooting wasn't Chris but Kenneth that was just killed and being devoured by a zombie. Afraid, she returns to the dining room to warn Barry that quickly takes care of it. They both decide to return to the main hall to report to Wesker that, apparently, is now missing as well. Looks like the situation is getting worse by the minute. This is also where we witness how cheesy the script is, principally when... It might be handy if you, the master of unlocking, take it with you. Thanks. Maybe I'll need it. And believe me, we will hear more of these. We will also witness another difference that makes Jill's run easier. You see, while she has a lockpick that unlocks certain desks and some doors, 
Chris will need to get small keys for the desks and the sword keys for the mansion doors that Jill can unlock with the lockpick. Truly a master of unlocking. After parting ways with Barry, we decide to head to the east part of the mansion where the lockpick starts being useful. As you noticed by now, the game uses pre-rendered CG images as background, with some kind of 3D mapping to have the character blend in and move around it. This was a genius aspect of the game design, as not only it would spare the console's resources that could focus on the 3D models, as it gave the devs the opportunity to add more details to the scene. This also helped giving a more creepy scenery, with some parts of the areas decaying, making us feel inside an horror scenario. Of course, by today's standards, it seems a little bland, but back in 96 it was great. One of the cons is that it doesn't look as nice when upscaled, considering that they are pre-rendered images that end up being pixelated when increased. In addition to the pre-rendered backgrounds, the team used fixed camera angles, which was needed considering the 2D images, and in a sense increased the tension level as we couldn't see what was behind a corner. And, to couple all that, they gave the player tank controls, where the character would move according to the D-pad arrow that he's being pressed. Returning to our rescue mission, we will soon be greeted by a pack of dogs. If, like me, you decide to run from your first encounter, this will be the time to put the battle system to the test. Simply point to the desired direction and shoot. The kinda automatic targeting system will do the rest. Of course, you will need to point up or down if needed. Furthermore, if you are playing the director's cut version, you won't even need to rotate towards the enemy's direction, as the auto-aim system will do that for you. Just be careful with some invincibility frames that some enemies will present, some training and you will be a true master of shooting. No pun intended, Barry. After taking care of the dogs, we will explore a little more the east wing of the mansion that holds some interesting stuff to pick up. For starters, let's grab the shotgun that will surely be useful on the way. While trying to get back to the east corner, we find ourselves trapped in the room that links the main east area to the one that had the shotgun. And surprise surprise, a deadly trap, as the ceiling is falling to crush our dear Jill. And looks like both doors got locked. Surely not an issue for the mass of an... Oh, uh, wait a minute. Really? I mean, just use the lockpick. Anyway, right before being smashed like a pancake, Jill is saved by our friend Barry that delivers the most iconic sentence in the series. Oh, Barry! That was too close. You were almost a Jill sandwich. <laughs> You're right. Please give that man an Emmy. After parting ways with Barry once again, we soon find out that the back door of the mansion, a potential escape route, is closed and will open once we retrieve four crests. And I must say that's one of the aspects I love about Resident Evil, the puzzles and how the places open up after completing certain tasks. And as a bonus, the director's cut offers an arranged mode that will change the position of enemies and certain items, giving more replay value to the player. You see, getting the crests is actually one part of the puzzle, as we will need to gather keys and other items in order to reach them, not to mention a surprise waiting for us in the attic. In our way, we find out that Forrest was killed by a group of crows. Guess that bazooka wasn't very useful to him, better take it with us. We also cross path with Barry once again, and... What is it? It's a weapon! It's really powerful, especially against living things. Better take it with you. But how about you, Barry? I have this. I swear, his social skills are questionable. Anyway, we won't be seeing him for a while. Time to attack the west part of the mansion and retrieve the armor key. The owner could have thought of a better way to get around the place. It's almost as he didn't want people to leave that easily. Hmm, maybe just my imagination. Reading some files also let us understand that some kind of experiment was being conducted here, and that it didn't go as expected, well, considering all the zombies we've been facing. 
we will also discover that picking locks isn't Jill's only skill, as she seems to be good at playing piano, leading the way to some kind of shield that will be useful to get the shield key. If you are playing with Chris, I'm afraid you will need to wait a little before getting the key, as the piano needs to be played by Rebecca that will need some time to practice. In our way to the attic, we find another STARS member, this time alive, well, barely. After delivering a quite dramatic line, There are terrible demons. Ouch! Uh, I could feel his pain. Jill quickly gets to the first aid room to get a serum, as Richard was bit by a poisonous snake. Sadly, all backtracking was done for nothing, as Richard dies from his wounds right after giving us his radio. Guess it's time to see what did that to poor Richard. Pretty sure it must have been an unstoppable and... Oh. Okay, well, forget it. Jill could easily avoid that, escaping unscathed with one of the crests. After getting the remaining crests that are hidden behind interesting puzzles, it's time to leave the mansion and head to the courtyard. That doesn't seem any safer than the mansion. The courtyard is kind of a central piece in the game that will link all main areas. While the area is relatively small, it's packed with dogs that can get annoying if they succeed in cornering us. To be honest, these are the enemies I hate the most in the game, due to their invincibility frame, as it's easy to miss them. Soon after stepping outside, Brad contacts us via radio. It looks like our coward teammate is still flying around the mansion. Unfortunately, it seems the radio is not working properly and he's unable to hear us. Having no choice left, Jill presses onwards until she reaches a new building that looks like an annex house. The guardhouse is much smaller than the mansion and quite easier. This is also where you will encounter spiders for the first time, couching though as they can be quite venomous. The logic here is the same, we will need to get keys in order to unlock new areas of the house. Jill will soon find out that the people around here share the same tragic fate as the one in the mansion. Before continuing, I need to mention the soundtrack, a key element of this game, and it's awesome. The game presents a pretty good amount of tracks that will immerse the player even more in this horrific adventure. The music helps to escalate the discomfort feeling we have while wandering in dark, cold corridors of each part of the complex. Of course, this praise is for the soundtrack of the original version of the game, as for some reason the team decided to change it for the director's cut version. Well at least in the arranged mode. And I must say, it's... well, very bad. Take a listen. And yes, this is actually in the game. Composed by Samura Gochi, that was supposedly deaf, the new soundtrack of the game is considered the worst in the series. And, as it turns out, it wasn't even really composed by the guy, and he wasn't deaf at all. A ruse he was able to maintain for almost 16 years. Thankfully, he wasn't invited for the next installment in the franchise. Well, time to return to the guardhouse. This part of the complex also hides an underground water tank, where experiments were done with sharks and the virus. I'm always stressed when entering the tank area, as the sharks are quite unpredictable and our movements limited due to the water level. Good news is that the room is small and we can take care of them quickly. After destroying another failed experiment, it's time to take care of a bigger foe, Plant 42. Here, we will be given two ways to kill it either by creating the V-Jolt, as I decided to do during Chris's run, or fighting it head-on, ending up being saved by Barry, which, I must say, is epic. Barry is really Jill's angel garden. After taking care of Plant 42, we retrieve the helmet key, that is inside the fireplace for some reason, and find out that Wesker is still kicking and had to leave the hole while running from monsters. The good captain also instructs us to return to the mansion to check the rooms we couldn't check before, not a problem now that we have the key that was missing. In our way back to the mansion, Brad contacts us again, but we are still unable to talk with him. It's imperative that we find a way to let him know we are here.
with John down, it's time to head to the basement with the help of Barry. Right after going down with the help of a rope, Barry messes up and the rope falls, preventing Jill from going back up. Here, we are left with two choices. Number one, wait for Barry to come back with a new rope, he will then give us a code to the library annex, or number two, head to the basement via a ladder that is under a tombstone that was buried under the floor for some reason. Guess we'll go with option two. The basement is quite small and crawling with zombies, that should be no match. By now, we have ditched the Beretta and took the shotgun and bazooka with us, which will make things go smoother. After taking care of the undead, we reach the kitchen that has an elevator linking to the library annex. Once there, it's time to retrieve the first modisk, in case you want to take off a secondary task, and the battery, that will be helpful in the courtyard. In the library, we will also see that the complex has some kind of heliport, which will be useful to contact Brad. Before leaving the mansion for good, we decide to do some more exploring and get the most powerful weapon in the game, the Colt Python. I'd recommend saving around 12 rounds for the final encounters if you play with Chris and 6 with Jill. Now all that remains is to snatch the eagle plate in the study and leave this hellish house once and for all. Back at the courtyard, we have what we need to get in the underground passage, as we can now operate the second lift and change the flow of the water that is blocking the way. This part will be complicated, as the place is full of hunters and traps. After opening some doors, we find out that Enrico, Bravo Team's leader, is still alive, well, barely alive. Apparently, he's suspecting that someone is a traitor in stars, and that all that is happening has been plotted by Umbrella. Before saying more, he's shot by an unknown person and dies. For some reason, that person decides to let Jill or Chris live. In our way back to the central area of the underground, we get a new crank that will open up a new section. After turning a platform, dodging a huge boulder while reminiscing about what Barry said in the mansion, That was too close. You were almost a Jill sandwich. We find a huge black spider, the black Tiger. This guy is fast and poisonous, but nothing our bazooka can handle. After killing the damn thing and taking care of the web blocking the other door, we solve more puzzles and get the wolf plate and another mo disc. We can finally say goodbye to this cold and humid place as the north lift will take us to some kind of plaza with a strange artificial lake. Placing the plates will reveal an elevator under said lake that will take us to the underground laboratory. This will be the last section of the game. Considering all we've done until now, this will be a walk in the park. At this point, you should have enough shot and shells to take care of the zombies. Keep in mind that the zombies in the B3 level respawn, so watch out if you need to take the Beretta at some point. Right after climbing down the ladder, we will reach a room with a couple of zombies and where the third and last modisk is. Guess we can finish that optional task now. Jill will start by returning power to some sections, which will unlock some doors and let us explore more of the lab. Our main goal here is to reactivate the main elevator for some reason. You see, we can't say that the narrative of this game is complex, as there are a lot of things we need to do just for the sake of it. In our way, we will also get three passcodes, thanks to the modisk we have been collecting. This will be useful later on. The engine room will also present the Chimeras, a new enemy that can be quite annoying as it's easy to miss a shot when they are hanging on the ceiling. This is also where we will find the control to turn on the power for the main elevator. Once we've done that, it's time to do the final part of the game. Things at the end can change depending on how you've dealt with some situations and the order chosen for some steps taken. And this is the beauty of Resident Evil, as it offers a lot of replay value, not only in the main character perspective, but also its secondary one. As you all suspected by now, Wesker is a traitor. I mean, come on, the sunglasses gave him away. Barry has also been working with him, considering that Umbrella is ordered to harm his wife and daughters should he not comply with Wesker's orders. Depending on how you did things, Barry can either shoot Wesker or leave you to your cruel destiny. As for me, it seems he decided to abandon me. What a shame. 
Wesker, like the cliché bad guy, is a show-off and wants to share more of his plans and show the result of his experiments instead of dealing with Jill. A fatal idea, considering that his toy tyrant has a mind of his own and kills his master. Jill has been gathering some titles at stars, from Master of Unlucky to BLW Terminator. A suspected tyrant is easy to terminate thanks to our cold pipe. And with that, in less than 5 minutes, Wesker saw his dreams and accomplishments vanish. As for us, it's time to get out of this place once and for all. If you are playing with Chris and manage to have Rebecca surviving the adventure, she will turn on the self-destruct system in order to eradicate the experiment and the virus. Jill does nothing of the sort. In our way out, it's time to use the three passcodes to save either Jill or Chris, depending on who you are controlling, and then be on our way. While trying to escape the lab, we find Barry lying down on the floor covered with blood. You guessed it. One of the endings has Barry dying and asking us to deliver a photo to his family. After saying our goodbyes, we head to the heliport and manage to contact Brad that comes to the rescue. If you are playing with Chris, we will be greeted with the final boss, Styron doesn't seem to want to let us go. Dodge his attacks, shoot a few rounds, and at some point Brad will throw a rocket launcher that we can use to quickly blast that failure into smithereens. Jill is lucky enough to avoid this battle. The helicopter lands, it's time to leave this nightmare behind. Case closed. Resident Evil is one of my favorite franchises. While the first episode is not in my top 3 list, it's a game I still cherish a lot. To be honest with you guys, it's not even the first one I've completed. I finished first RE2 and then the first one. And, well, as a fan of survival horror games, I really appreciate what this game did for the genre and how the series evolved and matured. Regarding this video, well, that was it guys. Thank you very much for being with me here today. If you liked the video, don't hesitate in leaving a like or even subscribe and let me know in the comments what you think about Resident Evil, which one was your first one, which one is your favorite one. I'll be more than happy to read what you have to say about this game. Until next time, guys, and as usual, take care. I have this.